I don't want to turn this into a competition, but like, I win. This may come as a shock, but not all herbalists got into herbalism because they're scared of big pharma. I got into it because my new job didn't offer health insurance and I had a UTI. I went to the free clinic at the naturopathic teaching school in my city and the herbs they gave me worked. Does that mean the antibiotics I used to have to take and no longer had access to don't work anymore? Of course not. Did I start to fall down the crunchy to alt-right conspiracy theory pipeline anyways? Yup. It's kind of built into the herbal education and that's why the classes that I teach, I actively combat against that. But everyone should have access to whatever kind of healthcare it is they need. We have to get out of our own bubbles and realize that our personal experiences are not universal. And my practice is not going to be invalidated by the crunchy cult that I got out of. I have to try this. Glitter in foundation, but on dark skin. I feel like if I use silver, it was going to be a little too chaotic, a little bit too much. I did my little color th theory thing. And I'm going with a brown extra fine glitter. I just didn't think those big little sparkles were going to look good. So extra fine. House Labs foundation in the darkest shade. Now for the glitter. Oop, I'm so scared. Oh my God. I'm going to use that much. I don't want to go overboard. I'm going to do a little mixy mix on the hand. And let's apply. Okay, we're blending her out. It feels a little rough on the skin. So if you have sensitive skin, I don't know. Do you guys see this? Because it is giving glitter. It's very subtle. And I didn't use a lot of glitter. Does a flash do something, guys? What do we think? It is so subtle, but y'all, period. Good night to bitches who can't drive, girls who wear big shirt, no pants, the LGBT community, what are signs, mentally ill bitches, bitches who drink decaf coffee, Harry Styles fans, people with dyed hair, Lesbian One Direction stands. Girls in love with Spencer Reed from Criminal Minds. Apple Juice Lovers. Bitches who relate to liability by Lord. People with anxiety. Hypersexual bitches. Girls who overthink. Hosier lesbians. Hot girls with stomach issues, bitches on Lexapro, people with daddy issues, and bitches who love their high school history teacher. Why does everyone have autism nowadays? Stats show that autism prevalence increased by 178% between 2000 and 2016. Some people argue that autism is just becoming more common. Others say too many people are claiming being autistic. And let's not forget the ableist statement of it's a spectrum and everyone is on it, which is blatantly incorrect and harmful. The increase actually has to do with developing research and the inclusion of oppressed groups such as women and people of color. It was initially thought that women couldn't even be autistic, but recent research has shown that there might even be more autistic women than men. The main difference between the sexes is that women tend to be more socially aware, which makes us start masking very young. If a young girl doesn't fit in with the other kids, she's immediately scrutinized and forced to mask and adjust her personality. Also, when a young girl is quiet and won't speak, she's just labeled as shy. But when a young boy is quiet and won't speak, he's immediately tested for autism because it's so out of the ordinary. And this is why women go undiagnosed. Boys are diagnosed with autism four times more often than girls. Now, in regards to ethnicity and race, white children are diagnosed 19% more than black children and 65% more than Latino children. I'm an autistic Latina, I'm 100% Puerto Rican, and that makes me part of the most undiagnosed demographic. My psychologist was an autistic woman focusing her PhD in autistic women. When I got initially misdiagnosed with bipolar, BPD, and schizotypal personality traits, the first thing that she asked me was if my evaluator was white, a man, and old. He was, in fact, a white old man. She warned me that women of color tend to be diagnosed as anything other than autistic because we're stereotypically labeled as crazy. So no, autism isn't more common now. We're just becoming more educated, have more access to resources, and research is furthering to finally include minorities. Bye guys. Most women have been told our, white women have been told our entire lives, be quiet, know your place, be a good girl, um, don't rock the boat, don't be too much. And when you are any of those things, you are ostracized because you have rocked their boat. And that is what black women are. You rock our boat, our mental boat, because you challenge us to look at how we are deficient and not living in our truth. 
Um, what's interesting about this video, you should go watch it. I'm going to put her, her handle in the comment section. It went viral. Uh, and in the comment section, there were some white women that were like, Ugh, not I, it is not me. And then there were some other, I don't know why she's British. Anyways, and then there were some other white women that actually agreed with her that were like, this is true. And this is great. I love when white people just say the truth. They pull back the curtain and they're like, hey guys, everything you thought was true is true. Shout out to this lady. Anyway, excellence is exhausting, so support black mediocrity by following me. Okay, it's time for a dress reveal. What do you guys think? I got a comment on that post that I want to address. Another trans woman asked me if being trans was a joke to me, and I know why she did that. And it's because of the way that I present right now. I'm, as the girls say, clocky. If you don't know what clocky means, it means I don't pass as a woman. And part of the reason that I started documenting my journey so early is for other girls that are clocky. Whether because they don't have access to hormones or surgery, or because they just don't have the goal of passing. Because you don't need to pass in order to be valid as a trans woman. But a lot of us feel this overwhelming pressure from society that if we don't look the part of a woman, then we don't deserve that title. And it's not uncommon for trans women to internalize that and project that onto their sisters. And the truth is, I'm hurt, but I'm not angry at you. But projecting that pain onto me won't heal you. It just repeats the cycle of the people that hurt you when you looked like me. Regardless of that, I want you to know that I love you. I hope that that clocky girl that you once were is healing on the inside, because you were just as much of a woman then as you are now. And I hope that you realize hurting me won't heal her. I love you, and I'm holding space for you. Of my videos, this is going to be one of the most important, so please keep watching. This morning, the Iranian government unalived Mohsen. He was 23 years old, and his crime was protesting. And like many others, he was not given a lawyer during his trial. And this is Ali. He's 20 years old, and he's on track for the same thing to happen. Iran usually does the unalivings at 5 a.m. at their time, so we have until then to really spread his name. So please, if you're able to, comment his name, repost this video, and do whatever you can. Thank you so much. Big Mac Burger Bell, let's check it out. Solidarity with the journalists over at New York Times. Over 1.1 thousand workers ranging from journalists to security guards pledged to stop work due to stagnant wages and unfair working conditions and are staging a 24 hour strike at the time of this recording. New York Times workers have been negotiating for over one and a half years and still have not received raises through the economic hardships brought on by the pandemic and inflation. If you want to help, don't visit the New York Times website and refrain from using any of their apps or word games. New York Times is a massive news organization organization that has absolutely no reason to ignore their staff's demands. What it comes down to is that this is just another greedy company that finds more value in allocating $150 million in stock buyback to investors than paying their workers wages that keep them healthy during inflation. I want to eat that. Give me some of that sauce. Basically, while being a single mom and stay fit, but... I still had the rest of my life determined for me because he chose not to pull out one day. I've said it once and I'll say it again, but reproductive abuse is one of the most hidden yet most common forms of abuse to date. Most men, but specifically insecure men, realized a long time ago that if they ever felt intimidated by their wife's success, jealous of certain attention she might be getting, thought she might leave and didn't want her to, or just overall felt out of control in the relationship, that all they had to do was knock her up. They recognize that although babies are miracles, they are essentially distractions as well as energy vampires when it comes to living your life. And they have no issue weaponizing their reproductive systems as well as their incompetence when it comes to taking care of children against women. If you're in an unstable relationship with a guy and he continues to finish in you carelessly, he does not care about your dreams, goals, or future. Please understand that. experience the pain and trauma that you've had to endure as a girl. This stupid fucking idea that cis women have, that cis womanhood is the most painful iteration of womanhood and that trans women can never comprehend that. How self-centered can you be? In what world does a trans woman not comprehend how it feels to be objectified or to not feel pretty enough or to feel that like all of your worth is based in your looks? Do you think the trans women don't know what it feels like to be excluded and bullied? No, because they have all of the pressures of cis womanhood in combination for being hated and discriminated against for being trans.
in what world are all of the problems of womanhood involved with you getting a period? You know how fucking reductive that is? Like it's not an oppression competition, okay? But if you wanna make it an oppression competition, trans women win. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> Cinnamon rolls, let's get this video rolling. <laughs> Masculinity is not under attack. It's evolving like it has in the past. If you buy into the bring back manly men moral panic, then you probably don't recognize how subjective gender roles are. The only reason why you think blue is a boy color is because of the context in which you were socialized. In fact, pink used to be a masculine color that young boys confidently wore. The fedora, a hat now mainly worn by men, used to be worn by women and was even seen as a symbol of the women's rights movement. Some cultures 400 years ago consider nobility pompous big wigs who wore fine frilly clothing that you would consider feminine today to be the ideal vision of man. Harry Styles is a confident masculine man, therefore him wearing a dress is masculine. And if the entire concept of masculinity is so fragile that it falls apart when a man adorns cloth that you find unacceptable, then maybe masculinity doesn't mean that much to begin with. I want to eat that. one thing that makes you the happiest. Is it boobs? It's boobs, isn't it? Women, we have to do better. We have literally been the cause of our own downfall. I don't know who needs to hear this and I've been thinking about this for a while, but there's no amount of transphobia we as black women can exhibit that will get non-black people and black men to stop calling us masculine, to stop calling us manly. It doesn't make us useful to the path forward. All it does is mimic the dynamics of white supremacy, which our only purpose is as weapons to keep other people oppressed. What does it do for us? Absolutely jack shit. This policing of femininity does nothing more than keep us in our place. And this colonial white centric view of what it means to be a woman, when has that served us? We are more powerful as a collective, not only including trans people, but realizing that the rules of engagement were never designed for us. This is why I say that if you give a group of people somebody that they can view as less than them, they will volunteer for their own eradication. Tasty chocolate nutcracker, let's go baby! San Francisco police are trying to push the use of robots that use explosives as a means of deadly force. Hypermilitarization of police is a result of the war on drugs, where we saw the Reagan administration sanctioning police to use more and more militaristic equipment. However, militarization doesn't make anyone safe, as people in poor neighborhoods were at greater risk of police brutality and death when subject to highly armed police departments. These robots will be disproportionately deployed in black neighborhoods. and will be a brand new tool for police misconduct. This isn't a measure to keep you safe. This is a measure to normalize a dystopian practice of automated policing crossing the threshold of using deadly force. There are literally so many things that would have been a better use of taxpayer dollars, but instead police are trying to push to get brand new murder toys as per usual. That looks good. I want to eat that. Did you know that something as small as leftovers has its own culture because it varies across different parts of the world? Namaste, I'm Pavi and I'm making myself a quick Indian street food style potato sandwich with a leftover potato fry that my mom made. It's spicy, tangy and so yummy. And it got me thinking how leftovers is not really a thing in India. We usually make just enough food for one meal and on some rare occasion there's some extra food leftover, we give it to someone in need. And if we go to restaurants, the portion sizes are small so there's usually never any leftovers 
and even if there is some we never take it back home the culture of eating leftovers is just not there but in the us leftovers is an integral part of a meal if you're cooking you make a lot so you can have it for multiple meals and don't have to cook again and if you're going to restaurants the portion sizes are huge so you inevitably end up having leftovers there might be multiple reasons why the leftovers culture is different and i'm curious what do you do with leftovers where you're from The way I can tell English is the only language you know based on the comments is crazy. I have people all the time ask me, "Can you stop using sign language?" Like, no. I don't know if you know, but like me and many other deaf and hard of hearing people, we rely on it. But I feel like if I spoke any other language like Spanish, the comments would look different, and maybe I'm wrong, but me using sign language is not hurting you. The lipstick Have you heard of drown towns? Drown towns are block towns that have been destroyed, covered up with either bodies of water or natural parks. Let's talk about Oscarville in Georgia. Oscarville was a booming block town in Georgia. It was one that has now been covered up by Lake Lanier. Oscarville was a thriving block community. Many of the residents owned homes, farms, they were educated, but this was a threat to white residents and towns around. On September 5, 1912, a white woman was allegedly assaulted by two black men. A few days later, the dead body of an 18-year-old white woman was found in the woods near Oscarville. It was alleged that she was raped and murdered by two black men. As a result of these events, an angry white mob called Night Riders rode into Oscarville. They attacked the black residents, burned their home down, threatened them, forced them to leave Oscarville. In the attempts to flee, many of the black residents were injured or they died. Oscarville was eventually filled with water and became Lake Lanier. In the 1950s, in the process of building Lake Lanier, the government acquired property rights to all of the properties in Oscarville, and only a few of the black residents were able to sell their properties and get the money for it. Today, Lake Lanier is said to be haunted. In the process of making Lake Lanier, The town was covered up and filled with water. Cemeteries were dug up and relocated. Hundreds of people have died in Lake Lanier since its existence in the 1950s. Have you ever seen something in a store or online and thought to yourself, "What is the point of this? Why does this even exist?" Well, consider whether it might be for a person with a disability. Maybe it helps someone do something more independently. And that's pretty valuable. None of y'all know how to act in a mosh pit, so I'm gonna teach you. Yes, I don't look like your certifiable hardcore kid, but that's okay. Girls can mosh too. Did you hear that? Girls can mosh too. But if you're going to go in the pit, you need to learn how to dance, and you need to learn how to take a hit and brush it off. Not everything is personal, so please don't try to start like a real actual fight unless it is personal. And trust me, you will know when it's personal. Keep the pit open. Let the air flow in and out. That's actually your best bet at shows is to stand alongside the pit unless a crowd killer is coming toward you. Crowd killing's not cool. Cool. Crowd killing is not cool. If you want to avoid mosh pits entirely, stand along the sides or stand in the back. Good to note that most venues also have a balcony that is open to everyone. Stop starting push pits. That shit is so. Goodbye. I don't really feel like elaborating on what a push pit is, so if anyone wants to talk about it in the comments, be my guest. Try hardcore dancing instead. You can practice in your living room, but Chiodos might get mad at you. Believe it or not, there's a rhythm to the mosh pit. When it's two-step time, you better be fucking two-stepping. You don't know how to two-step. I also have videos on that. Personally, I'm not a hardcore dancer, but there are plenty of videos of people hardcore dancing that you can watch. But also going to shows actually works too. Notice the person in the pit that's actually aligning with the beat of the drum and copy them. Lastly, in this video, stop targeting women in the pit. I'm gonna throw it in there. Stop targeting the biggest people in the pit. They don't want to be fucked with. Goes without saying. Stop targeting the smallest person in the pit too. And just have fucking. Fun. Now let me see you two step. 
let's talk more about this crunchy to alt-right pipeline because for some people it's hard to wrap your heads around it because it seems like a big jump, but hear me out. If you've seen firsthand, you can't unsee it. I'm not saying that anything natural is a cult or that everyone who uses a water filter is on the alt-right. And I'm not saying herbalism is alt-right, I'm literally an herbalist. But it's a slow and subtle slippery slope, one that I was lucky enough to get off, so I'm speaking firsthand. So it starts with being told that toxins are in all your food and the air and medicine and you need to avoid them by going all natural. Already we're looking at purity culture, classism, ableism, because this isn't accessible to all people. Then it turns into you're being poisoned by Big Pharma and the FDA so they can keep you sick and make money off of you. Now don't get me wrong, I support modern medicine, but I don't support the system running it in the US. So this is an easy devil to blame. But then the quote unquote they gets bigger and bigger. They become the entire government, the elites. You can't trust anything anyone in the mainstream tells you. You should only believe what the crunchy ones who know the secrets they don't want you knowing about. Meanwhile, they're selling you cleanses and diet programs. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're regurgitating sound bites about chemtrails, 5G, and the inner circle. Is this all sounding familiar? It's really not all that far-fetched. Every time you start talking, I think to myself, who the fuck does this girl think she is? You are so fucking boring. And he got Okay, tonight is date night. Let's get dressed. Starting off with these pants by Gabby Fresh from Fashion to Figure. They're always super comfortable. Period. Going with this top from Meow. This top always makes my titties look so good. I can't. Then gonna put this sweater crop on top. I gotta take my wig off for this part, so I'll be back. She's cute, she's cute. But we gonna make it better. I knew I was gonna add a belt. You knew, you know. So we're gonna turn it inside out so that I can match the dark brown that's going on with this fit. Put these shoes on. I feel like I look stunning. I just, I love myself. I really do. What do we think of the fit? One of my kids is incredibly emotional. Like she cries over everything. Happy, sad, scared, angry, cute dog. She's gonna cry. Her emotions are directly tied to her tear ducts. And I love that about her. She's so sensitive. So I always remind her how special she is for feeling her feelings the way that she does. I don't wanna teach her to hide or suppress her feelings. My goal is to teach her how to regulate her feelings and protect her peace. My daughter has a lot of big feelings and shame isn't gonna be one of them. She's emotional and sensitive and that's a good thing. Hypersexualization of black women and girls we see today contributes to social approval of violence against them, and sadly, this isn't something new. The Jezebel stereotype has long been used to characterize black women and enforce their sexual exploitation. You see, during slavery, black women's bodies were controlled as sexual objects. In fact, the institution of slavery depended on black women to supply future slaves. And in order to justify their sexual abuse, slavers started reinforcing the belief that black women were lustful and available. But this was hard hardly true, as Frederick Douglass even claimed the slave woman is at the mercy of the father, sons, or brothers of her master. Not only were enslaved women at risk of being sold or beaten if ever they refused the sexual advances of their slavers, but they were also considered property and so legally couldn't be raped. What's more, enslaved women were encouraged to reproduce. For example, some would get a new pick for each child born or no work on Saturdays if they produced six children. And if you think that only extended to women, think again because enslaved girls were also told to do so. In fact, young black girls were encouraged to have sex as anticipatory socialization to get ready for their roles as breeders. And once enslaved women or girls did reproduce, their pregnancies were then seen as proof of their insatiable sexual appetites. And unsurprisingly, that wasn't the only thing that reinforced the stereotype. You see, enslaved folks were often stripped naked to be physically examined, whether on the auction block or in private sales. What's more, enslaved folks of both sexes often wore ragged or few clothes because they were seen as property that didn't deserve that luxury. But what this did was reinforce the idea that black women were impure because where white women wore clothing over most of their bodies, black women often had their legs or thighs exposed. And this contrasting clothing, once again, proved in the mind of slavers that black women were uncivilized 
organized and immodest, even though they had no choice. So black women lost on every front, and their hypersexualization in the eyes of slavers was used to justify their rape. But that Jezebel stereotype was based on a lie and is actually contradicted by several historical facts. Although black women were forced into prostitution for white men, prostitution was not a thing in black communities. In fact, most enslaved folks sought long-term monogamous relationships and had very little venereal diseases amongst themselves. Adultery was actually frowned upon and during Reconstruction, enslaved folks hurried to legitimize their unions. Unfortunately though, Reconstruction and Emancipation did little to stop the sexual victimization of black women, but I'll get more into that in part three. Oh my god, I cannot believe it. Hey, did you know that since 2000, Walmart has had almost 500 different legal violations? Did you know that the vast majority of those were employment related offenses, specifically wage theft and lack of overtime pay, and also the environment? Because of course. And did you also know that despite year over year increases in profits, most Walmart employees are actually on Medicare and Medicaid, which means that this corporation is using taxpayer funded health care service instead of just giving their employees benefits like a normal company would. And did you know that the Consumer Expenditure Index is actually up a whopping 5% this year, despite rampant wage stagnation, which means most workers actually got a huge pay cut. So here's what I want to know. How come every time a story like this is reported, we hear about increasing crime rather than how these companies are actually stealing from us? White supremacy and capitalism benefits from us feeling like we are never enough. Which makes it that much more ironic that the self-love movement is dominated by white, cis, hetero, able-bodied people and institutions that are run by them. Because the version of self-love that they're trying to sell you is can you love yourself enough so that you can produce and be palatable to a dominant culture. And all of these systems force us to sever our own relationships to our bodies and to ourselves. Believing that you are lovable and worthy is not about a mindset shift. It's about the embodiment of all the values that capitalism and colonialism has asked us to sever that already existed within our ancestors. Good morning, bad news. For the last two years, billionaires and politicians have been speed running an economic collapse that only affects who? You. And has made it impossible to plan a future, afford a house, or even pay the rent anywhere in the country. Simply put, the one-sided economic response to the pandemic geared towards boosting the stock market at the expense of the working class pushed so many people out of the middle class and into poverty that the supply and demand for lower cost housing is now at an all-time high, which is driving up its price. Simultaneously, high-income earners who can work from home are gentrifying lower-income communities at an unprecedented rate. Now that they don't have to live in a high-priced metropolitan area for work, they're buying property and displacing renters in affordable units, which were already in a catastrophic shortage pre-pandemic, except now it's gone from being a shortage to a housing crisis because those units are being renovated and upsold at two to three times their price. And ironically, because the wealthy are moving out of high-income areas, the cost of rent in those areas has started to stabilize or drop, so those who were able to afford high rent to begin with and stayed are now likely paying less rent than before. So what does the future where only the wealthy can afford rent or housing look like? Well, as we're already seeing in every major city, a massive increase in homelessness, blight, and social instability. I saw somebody else make a video about this, and it's really crazy when you consider what this actually is. If you don't know, things like this and this are called hostile architecture. The designs may look different from place to place, but basically the purpose of these is to stop homeless people from you know having anywhere to rest or sleep. And it's like so cruel when you think about the fact that we have the resources to stop homeless people from just being able to exist in public and we're willing to invest so much design and creativity into you know just making it harder for them to live rather than actually trying to alleviate any of the factors that lead to people becoming homeless i mean look at that like is this who we are as a country as a civilization but at the end of the day our Economic system is prioritizing profit, not people. We as a society are not correctly allocating our resources. It's barbaric.
even the best song with a sample. It's not even like a top 50 Kanye song. Kanye was literally writing Hitler's Meat this week. Bro was hanging out with Nick Fuentes, who I need to remind you was going around in 2020 to different George Floyd protests and running around and yelling at black people. I hope these cops kneel on you triggers next. I have to say that with a hard R so you understand how he said it. Bro was rocking the MAGA hat for like four years now. Like this is some real stand for nothing, fall for anything shit. Like go take a real good look in the mirror. And really stop and reevaluate what kind of shit you're letting slide. And part of the thing that worries me out is I've been talking a lot about anti-Semitism over the past couple of months. And a lot of people were hopping on me and they were like, ah, you just, you know, why aren't you supporting another black man? You know, why are you supporting these other people? Motherfucker, when was the last time Kanye stood with black people? Like, really? And a lot of the social media support is coming from white kids who aren't even old enough to remember who Kanye was before the life of Pablo. Really, dog, this whole thing's a mess. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Christians in the gay community. Watch this. When you limit Sodom and Gomorrah to simply a lesson on homosexuality, you have missed three things. Number one, Sodom and Gomorrah is not about same gender love. It's about violence and rape. A mob of men want to rape innocent men. This is not same gender love. This is violence. And when we talk about same gender love, if you equate same gender love to violent acts, you have disrespected the conversation. Him loving him is not the same as a mob of men trying to rape somebody. Not to mention that the Bible says in Ezekiel 16 verses 49 and 50 that the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't same-sex lust. It was pride, gluttony, and an unwillingness to care for the poor and needy. The reality is that the Bible has been used as a tool of hate for a very long time. And that's why you have to read it for yourself. Let me know what you think. Listen, I don't want to cause a scene, but you need to stop flirting with my girl. Oh, she's your girl? <laughs> okay, prove it. She sent you a picture of two cute cats and said us. Yeah, so we're basically married. Do you have electricity supply in Africa? No, we don't have electricity supply in Africa, but anytime we need electricity, the oldest witch in our community goes to the top of the highest mountain in Wakanda, then summons the god of thunder, Amadioha. And then immediately the god of thunder strikes with thunder and lightning. She then captures the lightning in the bottle and distributes it to every hut in the community. And that's how we survive without electricity in Africa. Yeah. Here are my thoughts on things that we've normalized in queer culture that I actually think is very, very unhealthy. And for context, I'm a bisexual baddie who came out a couple years ago, no longer baby gay, thought I was gonna spend the pan, I thought I was gonna spend a lot of time just learning queerness and then the pandemic hit and that did not happen. So I sat with my thoughts upstairs and here are my thoughts. For starters, coming out is so weird. It's like rooted in colonialism, capitalism, white supremacy. It's like, I have to be out. And then once you're out, you can't like, you can't unbe out. So like, if things change, if things are fluid, if you're like, oh, I'm not feeling this anymore. I'm not feeling this label anymore. It's like set in stone. It's so weird. Another thing, tops and bottoms. That discourse in the queer community is so weird it grinds my gears because i also put white gays next to it because white gays really hit this hard it's like white supremacy with like queer flavoring like a little seasoning of queerness like it's just very weird that it's like again you have to say your sexual position and then once you're that you can no longer like you need to be a top you need to be a bottom there's no in between there's no and it's like queer, the whole point of queer sex is to be outside of head sometimes i feel like some people like 
want to be straight, but they just so happen to be queer. And it's really weird. It's like y'all want to, it's just weird. Next, types. Another thing where it's like, you have to be this forever. You have to like this person forever. I might be the wrong person to be talking about this. I might be super unqualified because I'm a bisexual. And honestly, I ain't got no type. Bad bitch is the only thing that I like. If you're a bad bitch, I like you. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're a femme, if you're a stud, if you're in between, if you're neither, if you have nothing and everything. I like it all. So it's just weird to me that it's like, you need to be a type. You need, you need, you need. Another thing, you hauling. What is that about? Like you, that that's my last thing. Bonding over deeply traumatic things on a first date and then you hauling. What's that about? Why do people feel the need to be like, here's my biggest secret. I mean, not only am I bisexual, I'm a Scorpio. So like, I don't be telling people secrets. So, well, till never. Um, <laughs> But like bonding over like really traumatic things and then like moving in and we're hardwired in our culture. This is all rooted in capitalism. We're hardwired in our culture to believe that love is scarce, that it's rare. We can't find it. We'll never find it until we find that one, 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 one person. But I'm here to tell you that love is not scarce. You don't need to U-Haul and speed up things in order to make things work. It's not healthy and somebody needs to talk about it and it's gotta be a Scorpio. It's gotta be Scorpio. So Fifteen years. You can't spell my name? Um, Autistic people tend to think bottom up. -E, not -E we build mental models. We come to conclusions. Rote memorization just doesn't really work for us. I'm not asking you to tell me all the presidents. If there's no logical reason why one spelling is more correct than the other, then forget about it. I'm bad with names in general. Sorry. Do you have friends whose names you don't remember? Listen, I remember things about people. Isn't that more important than something seemingly arbitrary? Do you have friends whose names you don't remember? <laughs> No, but for the first decade, I will forget from time to time. You're good. 15 years, you got the premium package. I remember your first and your last name. You don't remember my last name, do you? No, for the life of me, I can't remember right now. Part four in making my environment easier for my autistic plus ADHD brain. These replace toothpaste caps. No cap to unscrew equals fewer steps to complete the task equals Natalie is more likely to get that task done. Cheap, easy, effective. I put the packet on the glass. What glass? The little glass dish in the microwave. Got it. I close the door. Which door? Door to the microwave. What is wrong with you? You fall. Good morning, Nat Turner High School Freedom Fighters. I have an exciting announcement. After racially insensitive graffiti was found in the bathroom at Sally Hemings Elementary School, the school board has asked the entire district to host a Unity Day. I'm excited to share the Nat Turner High School Unity Day will be next Friday. Hit it! I got friends in no place. Here at Nat Turner High School, we don't see lack of color, and we believe European Americans are just as important as Americans. So get your permission slip signed, put on your favorite tribal shirt, and meet us and the gymnasium on December 16th for our 15 minute Unity Day. Our choir will sing the moving, 
European American Spiritual Redneck Woman by Gretchen Walson. We'll also share a moving quote from famous European American activist JFK. We hope you'll join us for this tip top showing of unity, old chaps. And we want you to know that even if you are a student without color, you still have a valuable place at Nat Turner High. Avatar has a white savior problem. With that in mind, let's talk native representation in media. I'm native of the Lumbee tribe, and this has been a series on my TikTok, so let's dive into it. Avatar follows Jake Sully as he gets sent to a moon named Pandora, which is inhabited by a group of aliens called the Na'vi. And on Pandora, a human mining company is trying to kick the Na'vi off their land, that way they can mine a substance called unobtainium. And side note, when researching for this TikTok, I found out James Cameron wrote the original Avatar screenplay back in 1995. And the film didn't come out until like 14 years later in 2009, so I am obsessed that he stuck with the name Unobtainium for all that time. Never change, Jimbo. It's also important to note that Jake Sully and the other humans on Pandora are able to link their consciousness to Na'vi bodies, allowing them to conduct diplomacy between the Na'vi and the human mining company. So just keep in mind that even even though he looks Navi in these clips, Jake Sully is really just a white man. Now at its core, Avatar is a white savior film. The white savior narrative has a long history in cinema and essentially sees a white individual, usually a man, save a community of color portrayed as helpless from disaster. In Avatar, the community of color in question is the Navi. While they arguably represent a number of marginalized communities, their story of being forced off their land by greedy business interests closely matches the experiences of First Nations people around the world, so they tend to be seen as native coded. Compared to the Navi, the humans on Pandora are almost entirely white, making the main conflict of the film essentially one between indigenous people and colonizers. Now the movie establishes the Navi as too primitive and helpless to fight the humans on their own. When Jake Sully begs the Navi tribe to leave the giant tree they live in because the mining company's military is on its way to destroy it, they refuse to listen and fight anyways. When their arrows do literally nothing and the military easily knocks down the tribe's home, we as an audience are implicitly told that the Navi's weapons are too primitive to protect themselves. They need a human to save them, and that human is Jake Sully. So later in the film, when Jake Sully is kicked out of the tribe for betraying their trust, he figures that the only way to be let back in is by taming this orange alien dragon. Now, essentially, the Navi tame alien dragons on Pandora, but only five of them over thousands of years have successfully tamed this one orange species of dragon. But Jake Sully pretty easily manages to tame one and is welcomed back by the Na'vi. Now because Jake Sully has been able to tame this orange dragon, a feat that no other living Na'vi has been able to do, we as an audience are inherently told that he is more capable than anyone else in the tribe. It also pushes this uncomfortable idea that Jake Sully is better at being Na'vi than any of the actual living Na'vi. Now I find the scene where he returns to the tribe on the dragon to be really telling. Notice how the Navi react to his presence by crouching and reaching out to touch him as if he's godlike. This imagery paints Jake Sully as a sort of white messiah, and this is also furthered in how the film literally implies that the Navi's god selected him to be their savior. And this is seen very early on into the film. When Jake first meets the character Neytiri, these little white jellyfish things land on top of him. Notice how Neytiri is reacting. Her awe indicates to the audience that something important is going on. We find out later that these white jellies are seeds from the Tree of Souls, which is basically a sacred site for the Na'vi where they feel closest to their god Awa. Them landing on Jake is implied to be a sign from Awa that he's special and seemingly meant for a higher purpose. In addition to this, when the Na'vi are preparing for the final battle against the mining company's military, Jake goes to the Tree of Souls to ask for Awa's help in the fight, and he confirms that he was selected by the god. Look, you chose me for something. I will stand and fight. You know I will. But I need a little help here. But overhearing Jake, Natiri tells him, our great mother does not take sides, Jake. 
She protects only the balance of life. Despite this, when it looks like the Navi are about to lose the battle, the creatures of Pandora arrive, attack the humans, and save the day, implying that Awa joined the fight. I can see some of you Navi heads in the comments saying, well, Jake Sully isn't really a white savior because in the end, it was Awa who sent the animals into the battle, winning it for the Navi. But at the same time, if Jake Sully hadn't prayed to Awa, the animals would have never shown up. And this is literally confirmed by Neytiri. Jake, Awa has heard you. Ultimately, not only are the Na'vi framed as too savage to fend for themselves, but Jake Sully is also shown to be their white messiah. Because if it weren't for him, the Na'vi would have perished. And I haven't even mentioned how this film fetishizes indigenous women, but we'll talk about that next. Tasty ube latte, let's check it out. My new favorite TikTok genre is conservative skits where guys named Tyler or Jason or some shit make up scenarios where woke people with blue hair do the classic, did you just assume my gender? Or something of that nature. Like you know when you have an imaginary argument with yourself and you get all worked up and eventually you realize, okay, I'm getting upset for an irrational reason and then stop doing that? That thought slips through the mental filters of conservatives. This blue-haired liberal lives in their walls. It's like an invisible CIA operative spying on them from rooftops. And the comment section of these videos are even better. It's like a fucking hug box full of people with the same delusions. It's like an AA meeting but nobody realizes that they're an alcoholic. And quite honestly, you know what? You know what? It's giving me life. It makes me laugh every time I see it. I want to eat that! Let's just get up to the lodge already. It's getting tired. Bitch, we don't want the, the recipe to your mom, Peach Cobbler, bitch. Ain't no back talk. So like me and everyone else, I binged the show Wednesday in two days. And personally, my favorite character in the show is Thing. He doesn't know it yet, but we're besties. And while I was watching the show, I couldn't help but notice that Thing does not use sign language. And I feel like he would be the perfect character for it because he's just a hand. I've seen a lot of people talk about this, but Thing could definitely do some basic finger spelling. I feel like it'd be so cool because sign language needs more representation in the media. I also wanna say I am so impressed with the person who plays Thing because he's not even an actor, he's a magician. But I can't help but wonder, what if Thing started using sign language in the second season? Because I know Thing uses sign in the original Adams Family. Tim Burton, keep that in mind. Fun travel tip, if you're ever in Simi Valley, California, and you need a gender neutral bathroom, Ronald Reagan's grave is right there. The desserts keep coming. You may have heard a little bit about the Hunter Biden laptop story and Twitter recently, but there's a deeper story going on, and that's Elon Musk turning Twitter into a right-wing news outlet. When Elon Musk took over Twitter, he said it would be politically neutral, which is code for right-wing. He quote-unquote leaked a bunch of old emails to a reporter named Matt Taibbi, and Matt Taibbi agreed to conditions for writing the story about the emails. Then when Matt Taibbi live-tweeted the story for some reason, Elon Musk kept tweeting about it, referring to we, as in him and Matt Taibbi both working on it. Musk and his acolytes keep talking about how they're just telling the truth, but of course truth without context is biased. Who knows what the next news story Musk will choose to break on his personal communications platform. Yay, dessert.
people are talking about colorism again and every single time this conversation gets brought up i see way too many black women light-skinned black women not only perpetuating colorism themselves but reveling and defending their role as the preference not only that they will defend the colorist black women or colorist men in general who date them and see them as the preference and i just would love to say like if you're the preference or you're a colorist black woman that man telling you he likes you because you're light-skinned and prefer light skins actually does not respect nor like black women and that includes you he really just looked at you like mm, you'll do because you're the most acceptable form of blackness and because he actually really doesn't like black women he's really only using you as like a colorist trophy to meet his black quota while also perpetuating his own colorism and hate towards darker skinned black women hoping that you just sit there happy to be chosen and picked and the sick part is some of y'all really are just happy to be chosen and picked which is like not only deplorable and disgusting because you then let colorism slide or you truly genuinely believe you're, you're, you not having as much melanin makes you better. But it's also doubly embarrassing because you finna look like Booba the Fool when you realize he's gonna treat you like shit too. Cause he don't like black women. Don't believe me, let the right white woman, a matter of fact, any woman that meets the beauty standard more than you do. Because again, you really are just stepping on darker skinned black women to barely get a crumb of the benefit from desirability politics. Watch how he treats white women and non-black women around you. So again, tell me, what is the prize exactly? <laughs> Because I'm confused. I'm confused. What is the prize in being the preference that is built off of the white supremacist beauty standard? What is the prize in being picked and chosen by men who either hate black women or hate themselves and choose you to offset that? I mean, nobody wants them anti-black or self-hating scraps anyways, but it's really just embarrassing. It's embarrassing, it's annoying, and insufferable. Your ass off to wear because it gives you fucking mental <laughs> Excuse me, you're standing in the way. Oh, in the way of what? I can't see what I'm painting. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you an artist? Uh-huh. Are you famous? My name's Orange Blossom. Ever heard of me? Nope. Hmm. Then I'm not famous. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Strawberry Shortcake. I'm one of the finalists in the big TV bake-off at the Little Theater of Times Pair. Maybe they put my picture on TV. Great idea! Oh, hello. Welcome. What percent of your anxiety would dissolve overnight if you knew that no matter what, you'd always have housing, food, and health care? 50%? 90%? How much of your depression would evaporate if starting tomorrow, you had plenty of time to spend with your loved ones, do the things you find pleasurable, and cultivate your own interests and passions. Here's the situation. None of us asks to be born or chooses or earns the station in life that we're born into, so we're all equal heirs to our stewardship of the earth. Yet 99% of us are robbed daily of our stewardship and forced to squander our most precious resource, the hours of our lives, trying to survive, so that the most powerful can enjoy unimaginable wealth and leisure while they burn the planet down around us. Nobody made the earth. No businessman or corporation made the soil we stand on or its fruits or the trees that give us shelter and shade. But a handful of people seized all the resources of the earth, put a fence and guns around them to keep us from having them, and forced us to work for them if we want to have the things that we need to survive here. Furthermore, to survive in this society, we're all forced to passively participate in the exploitation of others who are also caught in this net. Want some produce? The person who picked it was probably exploited. Jeans, sweatshops, coffee, child labor, diamonds, murder, probably. Everything from the land we live on to the cell phones in our pockets are part of a long chain of theft, brutality, environmental destruction, and exploitation. We know we're miserable, we know we're making everybody else miserable and ruining the planet, but to top it off, on a daily basis we're gaslit by politicians, by the media, by economists, who tell us that capitalism is the best way, is the only way, and anyone who struggles to make it within this system is weak, is lazy, is stupid, is a loser. We humans are at our best when we're cooperating with one another, when we're caring and sharing, and on some level, most of us know that. So it's really no surprise that mental health issues are exploding in this country especially. Together as a society, we could have built any world, a beautiful world full of love and creativity. And instead we ended up here. And it's okay to be mad about that or sad. However you feel about that is normal, healthy, and valid. And accepting that your emotional response to a messed up situation is natural, normal, and healthy is the first step to healing. So tell me, how are you going to heal?
Here are some ics that I have with my own gender, the female race. Today we're going to be talking about my ics about internalized misogyny. Trends. I don't want to see you dress the same. I don't want to see you say the same things. Not wanting to participate in trends is totally fine. I don't want to see you say, Puria. I'll let uh, somebody else handle that one. I want you to dress in your own way. When you go shopping, have you ever done that? Here's the thing. Have you ever gone into a store and been like, I resonate with that. Not, oh, this is what I saw on TikTok. Stop it. I genuinely always have a problem with someone commenting on what other people are wearing because firstly, it doesn't affect you. <laughs> I've been really open about the fact that I was bullied in high school for what I used to wear. And to this day, I still don't understand why it mattered. Everyone has different tastes. Everyone has different types of aesthetics that they want to adhere to, different types of personalities that they would like to portray and the way that they look. It's also really common for people to develop their own personal style while trying trends and different aesthetics. There's absolutely no shame in that. If you have nails that stretch beyond the sane amount past your fingertip. This is actually a huge ick of mine because who is really deciding what the sane amount of length is for nails. People love getting long nails because it makes them feel pretty, it makes them feel put together, it makes them feel elegant, happy. And as someone who like exclusively only wears long nails, I have never gone up to someone that I see that has short nails and said anything. Because you know what, the length of their nails, it doesn't affect my life. Actually, it doesn't affect my life at all but I genuinely cannot count the amount of times that perfectly good strangers, people on the internet, even people I know, will look at my nails and be like, how do you function with those? Well, I function quite well. I don't need to discuss my wiping techniques with you, okay? Some people feel comfortable in them, some people don't. And if you don't, don't get them. You're not built for them and that's fine. I'm personally not built to wear heels. I don't look at the girls that wear heels every day and judge them and say that, that heel is, is more than the same amount of heel for you to be wearing, okay? Not only does it give me the ick, but it actually gives me vivid, tangible stress. The gunk, the food, the grime that is under there. And you know, I'm actually really concerned to hear that because someone else's choices should not be giving you vivid, tangible stress. If you're feeling physical stress about someone else's decisions about their own life, I think it's seriously time to decenter yourself. Very cool thing, it's called washing your hands. Everyone has to do it. People with long nails, people with short nails, we all get gunk and food under our nails. Wash them. This is your big sister talking, okay? Any type of thirst trap or like, and my boobs, my boobs bounce on TikTok. Two interesting things. I mean, instead of just saying that you have an ick about it, you did exactly what you were explaining in a video online. And I'm seeing that this is a pattern because you do post thirst traps. I would love to know why it's okay for you to be doing it. Do you not like it because you feel jealous? Because you can't really commit to posting a serious thirst trap because you're embarrassed? Because if that's the case, honestly, I don't blame you. If body image was so simple, everyone would be posting thirst traps with full confidence. Or like, oh, I'm at the gym. This is how you just live your life to full- Girl! Must we really truly stoop so low? Yeah, one plus one equals two. A guy is gonna be like, the guy is boobs. Interesting that you're saying that posting about going to the gym and saying that that's having a fulfilling life is stooping low. Because why is it stooping low? Is it because you think that women post things like that for male attention? I hate to break it to you, but not every woman is like that. Not every woman is looking for male affirmation and validation. I am not a person that goes to the gym regularly, but I respect the hell out of women who make going to the gym their content or even just share that they're going to the gym. Someone who struggled so much with my weight, so much with going to the gym, so much with having an eating disorder, 
I know the type of courage that it takes to put your journey out there, out for criticism, out for people like this to make fun of you for absolutely no reason, for having a passion, for having drive. Yeah, every woman is posting going to the gym for a man. Definitely not for themselves, definitely not to motivate other women. It's the only answer. See, I don't like that. It icks me out. What I want to do is I want to riddle a man. I want to ask him questions that literally make him sweat. I want to show up to a date wearing this. And then I want to engage him in such intellectual and riveting conversation and humor and wit that he's like, what is the female? You're not better than anyone because you're showing up to a date in casual wear. You can be witty, you can be intelligent, you can be charismatic with a full face of makeup, wearing heels and a dress. It has nothing to do with you showing up in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. You're going in, not dressed up to test this man on his character. It's a little embarrassing. What's really impressive to me is a man who's able to sit across the table with someone who they find attractive and they're able to appreciate their intellect without being distracted by their beauty. If that's not possible, then what's the point? And it stresses me out because then girls are coming crawling to big sis and they're like, where are the good guys? I don't know. And I'm like, they're on the Instagram being spoon fed jiggle tits. Not to say I'm against being your sexual, powerful, bad bitch self. Like, get it, girl. But I genuinely think one of the sexiest things a woman can do is have elegance. And to walk into a room, she doesn't have to take her clothes off to make a difference. And to just have an essence of power, that is sexy. Elegance. I think we both have a very different definition on what elegance is. Elegance is not an aesthetic, and elegance is not being modest. Elegance is a mindset. Elegance is navigating through life and seeing other people's choices and understanding that even though you would not personally make those choices, other people are allowed to do whatever they want. People learn and grow at different paces. People are allowed to make a hundred mistakes until they get it right. They can go through a hundred different phases when it comes to their personal style until they find something they like. They can go to a nail salon a hundred times until they realize that having short nails is what's comfortable for them. But if you want to talk about being elegant and you want to talk about walking into the room and exuding power without having to sexualize yourself, this behavior of speaking about women in this manner is not elegance. I'm glad we could have this chat. I'm wishing you luck because there's a lot of women with long nails out there. So, Godspeed. So this is really cool. The American Girl doll series has released a new doll book. And this one is on body positivity. And in it, there is a section on being transgender. It explains the basics, how being trans is not an illness and nothing to be ashamed of. It also has a section on disability. And it's really cool to see such a mainstay in American girl life talk about these issues and talk about the different kinds of bodies that make us us. Of course, conservatives are up in arms. One, for instance, said another childhood innocence smashed by the left. But in reality, many of us could have grown up with this kind of representation and we could have used it so much. It's really important that we normalize different kinds of experiences of growing up. And I'm really glad to see American Girl normalize different kinds of bodies and what that means. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> hey, hey. Cute hairstyles to try out. The front braid. The butterfly. Why does autistic folks unemployment increase with the increased education level? Oh, so we're gonna talk about it. Okay, let's talk about it. I have some ideas. So there's a long history of capitalism treating disabled folks as if we are useless if we're not profitable to capitalism. If you want to learn more about that, there's this incredible book that I read on the All Audio App Clubhouse. It's called Capitalism and Disability. There's six parts. I'll put, well, the link to my Clubhouse profile where all the readings are on replay, which is like a recording, they're all available in the link in my bio. So if you follow that to my Clubhouse profile, you will find all six of these readings to get the backstory on Marta Russell's work about the way that capitalism treats disabled folks as if we're disposable unless we're profitable to capitalism. But as a person with a PhD myself that is autistic, the more that we learn, the more insufferable will we become to neurotypical. That's the long and the short of it. We say things they don't want to Prefer girly girls or tomboys? Um, I prefer neither. I think 
our society is going to collapse due to capitalism. So The issue of objectification isn't just about individual women's decisions. It's about the impact of this kind of representation on society. Although some women desire to make money and become famous through their bodies, this desire cannot be generalized to all women. Images that mimic pornography surround people's daily lives, not only nudity, but subordinate behaviors. It is a reversion to infantile obsessions. What we have found is not liberation, but dehumanization. This is my part, nobody else speak. This is my part, nobody else speak. This little light of mine, glory be to God, yeah. Did you know that square dancing was used as a tool of white supremacy in the U.S.? It's true. And who was the mastermind that wanted to convince the masses to dozy -si do their way into total Aryan domination? Henry Ford. I'm Dara Star Tucker, and this is The Breakdown. If you attended middle school in the United States as recently as the early 2000s, there's a good chance that your gym class strangely involved lessons in square dancing. What an odd thing to be teaching in school, right? Well, this is a tradition that goes back almost 100 years and is rooted in the fears that many white people had at the time of the supposedly corrupting influence of black music and dance in America, which supposedly was promoted by the Jews. Yeah. But Henry Ford, yes, that Henry Ford, had a solution for it all. Square dancing. To the center and back to your team. Now, ladies, to the center and you circle the lane. Now, Henry Ford was a notorious anti-Semite. When the newspaper he owned called the Dearborn Independent was experiencing waning sales in the early 1920s, he published a series of pamphlets called The International Jew to promote his anti-Semitic ideas to increase circulation. When they were translated into German, Adolf Hitler became a big fan of Ford's. He kept a copy of The International Jew and a portrait of Ford in his office. Now, the 1920s and 30s would come to be known as the Jazz Age. Black American music and dance rooted in jazz and blues were exploding into America's white middle class. Many white Americans didn't really know what to do with the sounds that they were hearing. Kind of like rock and roll in the 50s or rap in the 80s. In a very short time, black American music had shifted popular music and dance expression from this to this. Henry Ford felt that jazz, with its driving rhythms and devilish blue notes, was contributing to America's moral decline. He called it monkey talk and jungle squeals. He had somehow gotten the idea that Jewish people were manipulating black people into creating this music to destroy white America so that Jewish people could take over as the dominant race. Ugh, I know, I'm just the messenger. Ford decided that the best way to stave off this corrupting influence was to promote what was then known as hillbilly music, later renamed country and western. He put a ton of money into sponsoring fiddling contests and square dances all over the country. He even got many school systems to incorporate square dancing into their curriculum. Henry Ford is a big part of why country music is so popular today. Because of this influence, many states to this day still call square dancing their official state dance. The irony of all of this is that American square dancing was significantly influenced by the legacy of slavery. Enslaved people were often the callers who prompted dancers to swing their partners round and round. This hadn't been a part of the art form before that. Black Americans also created and performed a lot of the music used in those dances. So, as fate would have it, Henry Ford's racism actually helped to spread the influence of black American music all around the world. It would be so awesome. It would be so cool. 